Uh, thanks so much, Hannah, and uh, thanks everyone. Thanks for being here uh, tonight. Thanks for joining us online. Uh, particularly, thank you for your interest in young people. Uh, I'll let Rowan speak for myself. For himself, I find myself essentially a youth minister who is trying to fulfil a vocation of sharing the gospel of Christ with young people from deep within academia, <laughs> which may seem like a, a slight sort of contradiction. And, you know, there are challenges in uh, that sort of location. But I do that with the conviction that some deep academic reflection on the life and experience of young people uh, can actually contribute to uh, better practices uh, better ways for us as the church, as God's people, to get alongside young people and to help them follow Jesus the way that we've come to follow Jesus. Uh, and, and it's in that light that I'm really glad of this opportunity to present to you, uh, share with you some of the early findings from this uh, research project, your story, exploring the spiritual experiences of young Australians. This is a large scale research project. Uh, we're looking to hear from around 400 uh, young people as they uh, share with us their story, 400 young people who are willing to give enough of their time to complete uh, what is a fairly lengthy online uh, questionnaire. Uh, we are still in the early stages of, of collecting uh, data. This project has been going for sort of a couple of years through pilot uh, stage. Uh, we've got uh, main data collection um, that we're sort of in the middle of. There's going to be more uh, uh, insights from this project over the coming year, but we're looking forward to sharing with you some of the early things that we're hearing and the things that we're convicted of as we do this work. This project was initiated through the leadership of Converge uh, Oceania, which uh, Converge is a network of uh, youth ministry organisations. It's a global network. It arose from the Youth Commission of the World Evangelical Alliance and uh, the local network here in Australia, New Zealand and Oceania, particularly concerned for how we might shape our practice of youth ministry in ways that have been informed by primary research among young people in our local context. And so much of our research is drawing on what's happening in the US and the UK, but to hear what's happening here in Australia is a particular concern. As we begin, uh, it's good for us to uh, publicly acknowledge and to thank our funding partners who have made this project possible and they're uh, listed on the screen. Young Life Australia, Scripture Union, the Salvation Army, the Lutheran Church of Australia, Veda Youth, the Baptist Churches of New South Wales and the ACT, the Bible Society and Christian Schools Australia. And we want to thank also Dr. David Wang, who's from Fuller Seminary in California, who's extended his support to this project uh, um, through a project that he's doing on global perspectives on spiritual formation that's been funded by the John Templeton Trust. So in tonight's lecture, we are going to invite you to join us on a walk through this project in three stages. We want to begin with a bit of an introduction to the project overall, uh, where we want to locate our project among uh, existing research in spirituality among young people. Then we're going to dive into one aspect of what we're hearing so far from the young people who have shared their stories uh, with us. Uh, we want to uh, look at the experiences of dissonance in young people's faith stories. And then as a result of that, then uh, conclude with some broader reflections on how we might respond to this research in our work with the young people in our care. So that's what's ahead of us. I'm gonna hand over to my learned colleague. It's great to be with you folks. Um, sorry, I need to stay here. <laughs> I am a wanderer. <laughs> No, thanks, Brian. It's good to be with you folks and uh, a delight to be here. And I echo Graham's words of uh, being a person pursuing youth and young adult ministry engagement from within an academic setting as well. And it's been a delight to be, it's been a delight to work with Graham on this project and, and to have this opportunity to listen attentively and closely to the voices of young people as we seek uh, to hear them describe their spiritual experience in their words and in their terms. As Graeme's uh, commented before, sometimes in youth ministry, we spend a lot of time talking to young people and not always a lot of time listening. And so it's been a great delight for us to be able to listen and listen attentively. So the question that has been driving uh, this research project 
um, as we sort of zoom in on the plan of how we went about researching the experience of young people. Uh, and, and we just need a slight caveat here that in, uh, we've been particularly ex exploring the spiritual experiences of young people that have had some point of contact with the Christian tradition. So some surveys are just young people, broadly speaking, uh, of all um, sorts and flavours and interactions with spirituality or not. In our cases, we've just been working with young people that have had some point of contact. So they might be embedded within Christian ministries or on the edges of it, or just had uh, within a Christian school, but just some point of contact with the Christian story. So this is the question that's been driving this research. Uh, this is a question that Converge gave us to say, this is what we're seeking to understand. This is what we want to uh, see if we can find some answers to that will support ministry practice with research findings. What are the influences and the influencers that shape young people's experience and understanding of God? And from a research perspective, that is a tricky question because we have to get some sense of, well, what is their experience of God? What is their spirituality and faith practice? But then what's going on around it? What is shaping it? And perhaps what has been shaping that over time? It's not just a question of what they believe, but how they have come to believe it. Now, the reason for this question is very exciting for us because it's a developmental question. How is this shaped over time? But the reason that's driving this, uh, the reason for this question that has driven this research is, well, what are discipleship implications? If we can listen carefully to the voices of young people as they enunciate what has been going on in their faith journeys, how can we companion young people while developing a constructive and life-giving faith of their own? And it's a tricky question. It's a tricky, tricky question. So there's been a lot of research in, or well, there's been some research in Australia. It's hard to keep up with the UK and America and all the other things that are going on. Maybe you're familiar with some of these uh, pieces of research that have been um, tremendous contributions to our understanding of young people and spirituality in Australia. And if you think about this kind of research and other research from around the globe, uh, you can think about it that they, there's sort of four approaches that solve certain kinds of problems and create other kinds of problems when they uh, seek to understand what's going on in young people and spirituality. Uh, single moment research is classic sociological uh, survey research where you grab a young person, interview them, ask them questions, and it's things like, how many times do you pray? How often do you go to church? Do you identify as a Christian? What denomination do you go to? And it gives you a snapshot right now of where they're at which of course might change after lunch and they've had some pizza or something like that. And then it could be a little bit different or something like that. And so they struggle to show development and change over time. And so somewhat in response to that, this single factor research tried to get a little bit more of the why. How did someone's faith come to be the way it is? But single factor, it's a little bit more psychologically oriented and it tries to find a single factor that is a bit more explanatory of the whole. And so for example, can someone's attachment to God be understood by understanding their attachment to their parents? Or can someone's journey of individuation somehow explain their broader spirituality? And this is great research and it's great literature and I love reading this kind of stuff, but it's, it also has its struggles that it, it, it seems to approach faith and spirituality as a single thing that might have a singular explanatory factor and that can be somewhat limiting. And so that led to this third approach, which we call ecological. And ecological is taking a broader view of faith. Instead of thinking of faith as just one thing, and that one factor might be explanatory of it, it looks at the interrelationship. So it approaches faith as being a multiple factor of our self and our identity undertaken in the context of people and God and institutions. And it's something that we're quite leaning towards, as you'll see in a second, but it focuses on the interrelationship of the individual and their context and so on. And so it can carry a more of a developmental overlay to it. And of course, the gold standard is longitudinal. Uh, which is wonderful research, wildly complex, hugely expensive. Um, the largest youth and spirituality one that's been done, well, really the only one that's been done, that's 12 years running and $12 million going but strong. Uh, you can see it's quite a complex animal. And so it's just slightly out of the um, gamut of what we're able to achieve in Australia. Now, if we return to this question, what are the influences and influencers that shape young people's experience and understanding of God? You can hear that ecological overlay. How did a young person's faith come to be this way? What has been the shaping influences upon it? And so we've worked to shape our research within this ecological frame. And of course, that's a bit of a challenge because we've got to get them to terms with not only what is a young person's faith, but what's around it? What's been a part of that journey? How has it come to be? So very quickly, and without going through the whole bits and pieces of it all, here's a quick snapshot of how we have approached this. 
faith-based religious meaning systems. Is that all clear? I can move on. Uh, here's the gist of it. Uh, to get a sense of what a young person, how they practice their faith and what their faith means to them, we're looking at their spiritual practices, religious commitments, and their experiences of God, and that a young person enunciates that or pieces that together in forming not necessarily a series of beliefs, but a spiritual worldview. And then when you ask some, a young person to explain their faith, the easiest way for them to do that is asking them to construct that as a narrative. Tell me about the journey. Tell me how this is how you have come to, to be this way. And so these practices, commitments, and experiences of God come together in a young person as expressed through a spiritual worldview and their spiritual narrative, which was what we seek to hear within uh, these young people. And the survey actually us invites them to, to write it out. And in some cases, we've had young people submitting hundreds and hundreds of words to as they have this opportunity to actually kind of narrate their spiritual journey, uh, which has been wonderful. But of course, that's just getting at their faith perspective. We also understand that their faith is happening in the context of influencing relationships and influencing settings. And these are many and multiple, but just to name a few, we can think of their parents and their peers. Perhaps there are youth leaders, youth ministers and pastors involved in their life. Uh, podcasters, authors, musicians, the whole mediated world is obviously a huge part and, and quite ubiquitous for young people's experience. And so there are all of these relationships that also tend to take place in certain settings and contexts, such as youth ministry, churches, the home setting, online, and so on. And so we're trying to get a sense of all of this. And, and Graham alluded to the fact before that this is a fairly extensive survey. You're starting to get the picture. It's a fairly extensive survey, and we've tried to make it as fun and interactive as possible. Um, but sometimes we feel like just dorky old men putting memes in surveys to try and make it interesting. But sometimes it's the best that we've got. Um, but not only are we trying to get this as a snapshot, but we're trying to get this over time. And so our research process invites young people to reflect on their journey in childhood, in their early teen years, and then in the present time. And what that enables us to do is begin to get a sense of narrative, begin to get a sense of change over time. And that's been the delight. Listening to young people narrate their stories over time has just been wonderful. And uh, we were at an academic conference where we were laying this out for critical engagement to help us to understand what we didn't know. And basically the response from the academics was, you're seriously trying to do this? And that's when we got a little bit intimidated. But so it is a complex task, um, but it's been wonderful to engage with young people and to hear their stories in this way. So that's the method. That's the way that we've been trying to construct this and the, the way that we've been beginning to reconstruct how a young person's faith journey is over time and who and what is a part of that and how that's being shaped. I could say, is there any time for questions? But you get to type that down and we'll interact with that shortly. So let's dive into a big particular piece of it, this experience of dissonance. And just before we do it, let me just say then that in asking young people to narrate their story, uh, I, I guess it's a bit of a truism to say that the journey of discipleship is never taken just as a smooth upward movement of lower commitment to higher commitment. It's a journey of twists and turns, right? And as we've been engaging with the narratives of young people, it's become quite clear that uh, the overall arc is interesting. Uh, but if we just focused on this point here, and then this point at the far end, it's from here to here. Is that just a straight upwards movement? But look at everything that's happened in between. And so actually the interesting moments, the interesting moments, the, the, the important parts of a person's narrative is not the here to here, but it's all the turns in between, right? It's the turning points and the milestones in a narrative which are so important. And as we've zoomed into these moments in order to analyze these, we've found that actually these are the moments of dissonance. Now, dissonance not, might not be a familiar word for you, but dissonance is like sandpaper on wood. It's rubbing. It's something that's not quite fit and something changes as a result. When we experience dissonance in our life, it's actually an engine of change. Uh, and no change happens in your life without dissonance. There has to be some kind of disruption of your status quo in order to move to somewhere new, some place that's different. Now, if you're a preacher, you know all about this. If you're a preacher, you might want to cause a little bit of dissonance at the start of your sermon to create a bit of uncertainty to then challenge people to make a change, maybe. If you're a mentor or a coach, you might know that some of the most profound conversations you've had with people have been about whether experiencing dissonance, about something that's not fitting, and maybe you've worked to create some strategies with them to, in order to resolve this dissonance. But dissonance is the engine of change in our faith lives as well. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a road to higher commitment, but it can also be a road to lower commitment as well. And the experience of dissonance is rarely fun, right? 
It sounds lovely, dissonance just rolls off the tongue, but actually it feels kind of gross. And for some people, I might say, yes, actually, this is a real challenge to my faith, or I thought I was losing it or some other kind of negative phrase. But looking for these moments of dissonance becomes key to kind of find out what's going on. And some of these things have been shifted around. Sorry about the formatting. But you can think about dissonance then as being all kinds of different things. Short, sharp moments that happen in the space of a sermon, an aha moment as you're walking along. Maybe you're sitting on a rock watching the sunrise and, and all of a sudden something is different to you. Big changes in life, in the trajectory of your life can happen in a really short space of time. And that dissonance was quite quick. But also dissonance can be this durative long fog of something not quite being right and not quite being able to put your finger on it until you finally figure it out. Or it can be just a full-blown crisis that for an entire season of your life, and depending on how old you are, you might be able to look back and go, yeah, 16 was a really dodgy year, or maybe your entire 20s was a really dodgy decade. Um, we can kind of look back and with a sense of perspective, see dissonance over different time and different um, uh, intensity. Yep, okay. So dissonance is ubiquitous, it's the experience of everybody, but really what happens in dissonance, whether this turns out for growing commitment or lessening commitment, really plays out in how well one responds to, is supported through dissonance, and ultimately resolves it. And that's a key area that Graham will speak to in a second. But for now, let's just listen to some of the experiences of dissonance that young people have reported in this study. Being in this particular timing, you can imagine that COVID-19 is a, a bit of a thing. Right. And so as we listen to this, it's terribly objectified, but to keep it anonymity, this is case 12. I'm, they ha do have a name, but you don't get to know it. Uh, so case 12 says, ever since COVID, my faith has been rocky. Seeing the world in chaos, wondered how God, how a good God was letting all this happen. Right. Now, the sense of, yeah, that makes sense. I can understand that. There's a lot we can unpack in that. So this is an internalized kind of dissonance. It's raising questions of theodicy. How does a good God allow this kind of things together? Is God still in control? There's a, an internalized cognitive element to it, but you can also hear the emotion as well. Alongside COVID is questioning and doubt, what you might say is a bit more classic dissonance, the questions that arise as we live in a secular age. Uh, and so, Respondent 56 says, a few years ago, I did go through some challenges in regard to faith. I stopped wanting to go to church. Uh, sorry, I stopped wanting to go to church, going only because I had to, and I really started doubting religion. I worried that I wasn't making the right choice, was not convinced that everything the Bible said was true. You can hear this dissonance. There's something that has slipped from this person's experience of church and of the Bible is reducing a sense of meaningfulness. Case 92 again, I've doubted and questioned even if God still loved me because I was so unhappy. You can hear there's an emotional dissonance now. There's an affective sense to that. And Demi responding, I used to have a lot of questions, but now I'm just too scared to ask. If you unpack the rest of her story, you can see that that was a particular poignant moment in, in the way she described her experience of faith. Mental health has also factored quite bigly in the, uh, our research. Um, and it's really highly co-located uh, as mental health is present in a person's life. It's commonly associated with significant struggles in faith. Um, and you can see these particular quotes, uh, particularly during experiences with mental illness. I doubted his presence, but was still accepted his authenticity and power. Can you hear the dissonance? This was going, but this was holding strong. And the two were in a kind of a tension together. Again, a kind of an internal and effective. Uh, in case 234, this often leads me to heavily doubting my faith and feeling fraudulent in my complacent actions surrounding my religious practices. What I um, appreciate about this response is so often young people really struggle to enunciate their faith, but given the opportunity to write, which is a little bit of a hurdle for us getting responses, but giving the chance to write, actually some people can be quite articulate in the way they enunciate what's going on for them. And here, it's not just I felt bad, it's that I felt fraudulent that some, there wasn't some kind of hypocrisy going on here. So again, a different kind. Uh, so the social setting is a huge source of dissonance, both with Christians and non-Christian friends. Some Christian friends they found to be uh, false friends. Some non-Christian friends were incredibly discouraging. In some cases, it's close romantic partners being non-Christians. Sometimes the relationship is the source. Sometimes the way others respond to that is also the source of dissonance. But the social setting just seems to be rife with dissonance. And so often, if the social world is going well, then their faith is going well. If their social world's not going well, then faith's not going well. So there's an interesting co-location of faith 
and the social environment for young, uh, young people through this time. And finally, it wouldn't be dissonance without real struggles with gender and sexual identity. The LGBTI question is live and rife for our young people. Uh, in this case, it was a person who seems to be the milieu seems to be challenging, just working out what they feel and think about this in relation to their friends. Uh, for others, it was their experience and needing to navigate their acceptance or lack of acceptance that's coming from within church, within family and with friends and so on. And so in all these cases, we can see many examples of dissonance and these being kind of the engine room of faith change and turning points and transitions. But as I mentioned, it's really the response, the individual response and the response of others around that that became very determinative of how this played out for them in terms of their faith journey. This is where I hand back to my learned colleague to guide us through. As Ron said, it's so interesting and, uh, and in one sense a privilege to be able to hear what's going on uh, for these young people. And as we dig into these experiences of dissonance, uh, begin to see some common themes of what, what is really going on. Uh, uh, COVID, as we've said, has been a, a theme. But for uh, this young person, COVID is now, uh, uh, again, some sort of uh, threat to the, dis to the equilibrium of life. But the problem is not so much COVID itself, but, but the response of the church. This, it's, it's how the church is responding to COVID, which is the particular uh, experience of, of destabilization. What's going on here for them, see this contrast between what they expect of a church that should be, in their words, known for love and kindness, and who are instead becoming known for being angry and opinionated on matters outside of the main Christian message. So there's, a, there's an internal tension of what they were expecting, hoping for, and what they've uh, experienced. The same is true for what many young people said about uh, mental health challenges. Uh, mental health uh, just seems to be part of the landscape, but the real dissonance comes in the response uh, from the church. True also in experiences of doubt. We see here in Kylie's case, now, by the way, when there are numbers, that's from our main data collection, the, the names are pseudonyms from the pilot study. Um, but here, uh, this uh, young woman, her doubts and questions seem to be combated by uh, a church of, and where she experienced this as, well, a, a response of bringing theological truth, but without a sense of sympathy or, or compassion. You know, perhaps the clearest message that is coming through uh, this um, uh, data as we read it is that the biggest threat to flourishing faith among our young people, it's not those traditional sort of external threats, the world, the flesh, the devil, but actually it's the internal challenge. It's, it's the church. Um, uh, the church for so many of our young people is the place of dissonance. The people who discourage me from faith the most are Christians. The church has been nothing but a huge disappointment. And this isn't because there is this cohort of young people that are abandoning community for some sort of radical individual path. No. There is a longing, you hear this in case 22, longing for a genuine faith community experience. But instead their experience has left them very, very wary of the church. And as I've reflected on this, the, the, the first challenge for me has been to reflect carefully on this question, what experience of Christian community are our young people being left with? And that, that's got to be uh, at the centre of our concerns. Not just what are we presenting, but what are they experiencing? As Leslie Newbigin has said, uh, the believing congregation is the only hermeneutic of the gospel. That the one thing 
The one thing that will persuade people to believe the gospel, he says, is a congregation of men and women who believe the gospel and live by the gospel. Now, he, he doesn't ignore all the other things that we do in Christian ministry of uh, uh, preaching the gospel and uh, uh, teaching and all these other formative uh, practices. But for him, it was this lived experience of the life of a congregation. That, that is what would hold all those things together. And that claim is clearly supported in this research for Australian young people. What young people are witnessing of the church and how they're experiencing the church is often the decisive factor in their faith journey. It is true that for many of the young people that we're hearing from, the church has been a turnoff for them. But the church can also be a community that holds young people, a, a, a sort of a plausibility structure, uh, Newbigin would say, uh, for the gospel, the kind of community within which young people's faith can flourish. Consider this expression of doubt. Case 33 uses language of doubt, but it seems to be resolved fairly quickly. I doubted Christ during my early teen years because I didn't like sticking to the strict life of faith. Today I realise how silly I was. Now I have a steadfast faith. <laughs> of course, it's typed, so we don't have the sing-song sort of expression, <laughs> but it's sort of hard to resist. It's sort of, uh, I read this and I wonder about the, the real depth of that experience of doubt and I wonder about the depth of commitment uh, that has followed. Contrast that with case 56. Here we have a young woman whose dissonant experience of doubt has actually driven her more deeply into the life of faith. And that step of faith change has come for her through the holding environment of the church. Conversations with older believers, conversation with her mother and her experience of church leaders. Now, here's one of the limitations of the written thing. We're not quite sure how she's come to realise that her church leaders are just ordinary people who are growing and facing challenges themselves. Maybe it's because her mother says, oh, you know, well, the minister, he's, he's you know, a bit dodgy. Um, or whether it's the minister who is, you know, himself claiming that or herself claiming that in the sermons. But either way, she has come to a point uh, through the fellowship of the church to recognise that doubt need not be something that drives her away, but part of the landscape of faith, which she's finding resources to be able to navigate. We see this also in Andrew's story. A young man came out as gay, but found his church community to be a place of support, even a second family. Now, from what we can tell from reading uh, the rest of Andrew's story, what he says about this spiritual community, it's pretty clear that this is not a community that is sort of notably theologically progressive on issues of sexuality, quite the contrary. Yet there's a quality of care that this young man has found that has kept him connected, not just to the church, but connected to God. So there's a taster. It's a taster of some of the things that we're hearing uh, from young people. As I said, there's, there's plenty more to come and uh, uh, you know, stay tuned, uh, keep watching this space in uh, the coming months. But already there is something deeply moving for me about hearing how these young people are speaking about the challenges of faith deeply challenging about what they're saying to us, the adult church, and also something really beautiful about the ways that adults have come alongside young people and accompanied them through these years of challenge. So what I want to conclude with in this brief journey is to stand back and to share just three broader reflections 
Three things about discipling young people that have emerged uh, for me and for, for us in conversation as a result of this work. And the first is that to have a better conversation, we need to ask a better question. I'm not sure who first said uh, this line, but uh, I uh, heard it most recently in a conversation in a meeting with Hannah. So uh, for the time being, Hannah gets the footnote. <laughs> thing is, a common experience in surveying young people uh, is the inarticulacy of young people. They don't have much to say, particularly when it comes to questions of religion and faith. Uh, Rowan did uh, mention that we've, we've received some wonderful uh, written uh, responses from, from young people. We've also received a number of fairly terse, fairly straight to the point, a um, uh, number of abbreviations with not a whole lot going on. And that's fairly common. Uh, Christian Smith's research in the US uh, have noted, uh, they note that the profound inarticulacy of youth, particularly when it comes to questions of religion and faith, but their guess is, their suggestion is that this could be because young people aren't interested in religion or, they say, and I think this is more on the money, at least for a number of, of young people, is that they're not getting the help from the church to learn how to express their faith. And we got that from one of our respondents. Uh, at the end of the lengthy <laughs> survey, uh, she says, well, that took a little effort, but I'm glad I did it. The survey asked me questions I've never thought about, and it helped me to see my faith journey in a completely different light. Thank you. And that warmed our hearts. <laughs> because this, is this we realised, is not just a project for the sake of discipleship. It's actually a, a, an exercise in discipleship. And the, the opportunity, the thing we want to encourage church leaders, youth leaders, is to see the opportunity presented, gathering a group of young people and saying, let's do this survey together. Bring your devices, we'll work out consent together, and now let's do the work, and then let's have this conversation and ask the question that obviously no one has asked her before because she's never thought about this before. Ask a question in a way that's going to enable them uh, to engage. Connected with the value of a well-put question, my second point is the recognition that young people are asking for the kind of discipleship that would accompany them through a complex journey. We've spoken about the complexity of the faith experience, this ecology of, of influence. If we listen to these young people, then we'll hear their plea for adults who would join them with a posture of companioning, of listening, of clarifying, rather than one of telling and directing and confronting. To hold the gravity of their questions and to accompany them through it. Now, of course, these observations from what we're hearing are observations. They're a description, and description needs theology before we plot an appropriate cause of action. Our primary aim in this work has been to listen well. And as Rowan said, the church has spent more time talking about young people and to young people and not enough time listening to young people. And we're trying to redress the balance here as we hear what it is that they're saying. But like any good conversation, we listen carefully so that we might respond thoughtfully. And a thoughtful response from the church is, need to, is going to need to call on all of our theological reflection and resources as we think about how to frame a careful and effective, faithful ministry. We don't have time for that tonight. If you want to think more, enroll in DE037 or DE035, first or second semester next year. But let me conclude with just one deep and clear theological conviction. And that is that young people created in the image of God have voices that must be heard. Young people 
created in the image of God, have voices that must be heard. Do you remember the story of Rhoda, the servant girl in Acts 12? Peter has been arrested and imprisoned, and the church has gathered to pray. But then miraculously, Peter is released, and he comes knocking at the door, and Rhoda, the servant girl, comes to the door, and verse 14 of Acts 12 says, when she recognised Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. <laughs> silly Rhoda. <laughs> Isn't she silly? Just what you'd expect from a little girl. And often how we've responded to young people in the life of the church. But of course, Rhoda was right. <laughs> And when the adult members of the church insisted that there was no way that Peter could be at the door because he was in prison, well, Rhoda insisted and she was vindicated. Our young people have their stories of faith, even if their stories sound silly, even if their stories challenge or contradict what we believe and are convicted of. We honour them by hearing their stories. And as we hear their stories, so we also honour the God who made them and who is calling them to himself. There's the link to our project. We would love you to get involved. We would love you to invite young people to come and share their story so that we might hear more so that we might be able to respond with greater wisdom. Thanks. Great. So uh, this question says, uh, is there any potential for extending this research into early adulthood, et cetera? This is so interesting, but what reflections would we see come out of that um, for a transition into adulthood? Uh, it's a great question and um, we would love to extend it in that direction at the moment our age bracket that we're surveying is 16 to 20 year olds the ambit that we're given by converge is that the question is for for young people for adolescents for um, we couldn't extend too far down into that age bracket because there's lots of ethical constraints around uh, surveying and interviewing in that age range so 16 to 20 is where we're um, currently focusing the questions. There certainly is so much application to what this means for the transition into the young adult space. And I think given that we are going up to 20, we're getting a number of years in the post high school era. And so we're getting reflections of that. Um, the other, I guess, aspect to the way we can respond to this is upon doing this research, the intention is to develop resources that can be applied broadly. And so that the way that, um, so it's not going to be necessary for everybody to do 146 question it in order to figure this stuff out. We hope to produce resources that bring that down to. So as a youth leader, you could work with a small group and here's a 30 questionnaire, so forth. And that could be then targeted for a younger group or a young adult group. Uh, this is a good follow on from that because you've already answered the first part of it a bit. But this question just says, how have you defined young Australian age, citizenship, country of birth, or those some of those parameters? On the citizenship, country and birth thing, we're, we're just looking at people who are ordinarily resident uh, in Australia. That's our, that's our definition. Um, and young Australians, we are asking for people to reflect on their later teen years, the sort of the, the year 11 and 12, um, sort of 17, you know, 16, 17 uh, um, time. And for me, like I'm, I, I, I think the whole young adult space is really interesting um, and there's some excellent work that uh, that Rowan has done in the young adult space and there's a lot going on there. I'm really interested in the mid adolescent time in that sort of 16, 17, 18 and that's what we're trying to uh, get a get a handle on. So one of the dangers of going too far into the later uh, adult years is that you, you begin to get a bit more of the reflection on what's happened for them after high school, which is all, all wonderful, but uh, as a Youth Minister, I really want to know what we're doing when they're when they're at high school. So 
That's, uh, that's been our definition. So we asked them questions about what happened in your childhood. Tell us about what happened in your early teenage years, sort of up to year 10, and then what happened in your later teen years, sort of 11 and 12, year 11 and 12 and up to now. And there's actually a couple more questions that all relate to this question about the parameters, I think, of uh, people included in the study. So denominations, uh, which parts of Australia, how are you accessing, who are you kind of giving it to or how's it going out? Are there any requirements around that or who gets to be involved? Yeah, yeah. Uh, any, anybody gets to be involved. Um, uh, where we've gone through our uh, funding partners who are uh, spread across the country. Uh, we're interested in young people that have had some connection with the, the Christian church, whether a school, a, a youth group, a, um, a community organisation. So we're looking uh, far and wide. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the, the Christian schools are probably our best reach into young people who don't have any faith. Um, often the, the people who are involved in our churches are at least searching or interested. We've got a lot of responses already from keen Christian young people. They're the ones that are willing to spend 30 to 45 minutes filling in a survey that their youth leader has asked them to. Uh, we're hoping that uh, the Christian schools will enable us to, to get whole class cohorts of young people that be a, uh, across the board, uh, but we are gathering from all across the country. Uh, this question says, um, what similarities and differences have you found with, in your research to the research coming out of North America? Um, one, one thing that we're, interestingly, that most of the work that's being done has been that sort of snapshot type type research. Okay? Um, and this is not a contrast with our work, but there's a, a project, the Australian Generation Z study, Andrew Singleton and others um, have, uh, have done that work, and they've, they've discovered um, uh, six different uh, worldviews uh, of Australian young people. 23% uh, have a, a this worldly, very sciencey sort of view of, uh, of life. There's about 18%, uh, is it, that have a indifferent, like, I don't really care, I'm not interested at all, type worldview, very Australian approach. Uh, there's the spiritual but not religious, there's the eclectic seekers, uh, religiously committed and nominally uh, religious. Okay. Uh, that, that is an interesting contrast to the, to the US in that the, the indifferent group, I think, is a, is a more significant part of the Australian landscape. There, there is the sciencey sort of uh, uh, atheist type, type uh, group that, that's fairly committed. But that's, a, that's certainly not the majority. What we are finding, which is interesting in contrasting the snapshot type uh, work with the narrative work, is that, as I said before, there are a number of young people in our sample that are part of that religiously committed bunch. But once you begin to dig into the trajectory that their faith story is on, we realise that there are only a few people that are really comfortable in that religiously committed uh, bunch and are likely to remain so over the next years. There are a whole bunch that are pretty clearly on a trajectory towards being an eclectic seeker or pretty clearly on a trajectory towards uh, nominally uh, religious. And that's part of what you see with this sort of dynamic uh, narrative approach. Interestingly, the, the people that have done the National Study of Youth and Religion in America, that the massive longitudinal study that uh, Rowan was talking about, they're also engaging on a, a narrative type uh, uh, study, um, similar to what we're doing. Um, uh, similar in the sense that's the same sort of question, different in that they have millions of dollars of funding and lots and lots of people doing it and lots and lots of time to write it up, but that's what you get when you're an American. Um, a few questions here grouped around this idea of listening. Uh, so one about practical suggestions for how churches can be better at listening to young people. But um, uh, there's one here that then also I think relating to that says, um, how do we kind of teach as we listen or listen well, but not just, just listen? 
think that's the sense of the question. Sure. <laughs> um, something that I've um, become increasingly um, convinced about, maybe, is that um, my, my PhD work was, was traveling with young adults who've had significant faith crises or significant transitions. Some would say they were losing their faith. And they began to, they have echoed things that were similar to what you saw in, in um, one of Graham's last quotes from a respondent who said, gee, this process was really helpful. And this process of being, uh, when we then began to look at a number of the quotes of when things are, when, when something went well, what, what went well? Um, when, if you uh, have been um, encouraged or assisted by someone in your faith, what was happening in that moment? And the overwhelming, the overwhelming response of people was, they took my question seriously. They helped me to work through it. They, as um, that, that great quote said, they appreciated the gravity of this. Um, they taught me to wrestle with questions. They, uh, you can see that there's something about supporting the agency of young people and not taking that away from them. Um, as a tremendous gift in this process of helping them with faith. And then the second part is that when you're in dissonance, when you're in doubt and when you're in confusion, you're in confusion and you're disoriented. And so for some people, you might think that the best way you can respond there is to teach their way out, but it takes away the agency. Um, and it's not that that's an inappropriate move, but you can also consider the simple act of helping a young person to understand where they're at or to gain just a bit of clarity around what they're confused about is an extraordinary gift right for someone to say for example COVID really messed with me I, I, I don't know how good God you know to be able to orient them by saying you know Christians have been asking that question for like a thousands of years you know like you can chase that one back and, and here's and there have been some responses let me point you in some of the directions it feels a little bit teaching but you kind of orient him to this fact of going you're not alone in asking this it's Christians are allowed to ask this question here's some lament psalms where people have said even worse to God if you want you know you're kind of keeping their agency and, and encouraging them but most of all you're providing a clarifying presence so i cannot underline enough the the the, the presence of a non, uh, sorry non-judgmental presence that enables a young person to clarify what is otherwise confusing and disorienting is a tremendous gift in and of itself and realize that uh, in holding the gravity of a young person's question you are teaching them you are saying to them i love you i respect you um, your questions are valuable. And all of these things are things that we want to teach young people. And they're actually a number of things that we've perhaps failed to teach young people effectively because they, they, they don't hear it. And perhaps they don't hear it because we hear the first half of their questions say, oh yeah, I've got an answer to that. I've got, I've got four diagrams I can give you on that. And so so there, is, there is a teaching that comes from that, that, that stance and teaching them something that is deeply significant and, and a message that so many of them are just not hearing, that they are loved by God, they are honoured by God, and that their questions are worth asking um, and that there's, there's validity in the sorts of concerns that they have. I'd, I'd say also that, um, uh, that a question is a prelude to a conversation. And so a conversation does have an opportunity for uh, uh, me as a leader, for you as a leader, to, to be a person of conviction in that conversation, but it's a conversation. And so, okay, I, I hear this from you. You know, for me, this is, this is, this is what it's like for me. What, what do you do with that? And, and always it is uh, leaving the young people with the privilege and the responsibility of making their own choices. We've, we've been sort of thrown into conniptions by the uh, state government legislation around what we can and cannot say in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. In one sense, it's a bit of a gift to us because that's a reminder to us that we ought to have been saying this to young people all the time. Don't, don't follow Jesus because I'm telling you to. Don't read your Bible every morning just because Graham said that I should. You need to choose. You make the choice. You have the privilege. You have the responsibility of understanding from God what it is that God is calling you into. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And uh, we can have the conversation of what that might look like. But, but here's the decision that 
belongs to you. And we want to encourage you to make those choices and we'll walk with you as you do. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, good questions here now, but we're already over our time. So I'm going to finish with one last one. Um, and this is the one that got the most votes. So uh, it's a broad question. You can answer it in any way you see fit. Uh, how can we resource the church to support young people better, especially with LGBTQI related challenges? Referring to support for parents, youth leaders and non-youth leaders, what could help? That's quite broad, but perhaps you've got good thoughts, particularly arising from your work. There, there is so much to say, but I, I think I, I would go back to that uh, simple message of we want to be able to communicate to all of our young people that they are loved by God, they're created in the image of God, and whatever it is that they are uh, wrestling with, whether for themselves or whether in a relationship with their friends or just as they respond to the media, that all of that turmoil, all of those questions, all of that uncertainty, all of that is loved and, and honoured and held uh, by God. And that I as a Christian and as a member of the church, I want to walk with them through that. I want to accompany them through that complexity. And I think if we don't acknowledge that this is really difficult, that we, I, I've got an answer to that, um, then, then I think we've lost the conversation. Um, uh, now, certainly there are things uh, to be said, um, and uh, we'll need to uh, think carefully about how to do that, and I can't really answer that in the minus seven minutes that remain. Um, but if we don't begin those sorts of interactions with that sort of patient listening and sitting alongside um, uh, in the dust together, then we got very little hope of anything that we say, even the most wise, profound and sensible thing, uh, very little hope of that gaining any traction in a young person's life. <laughs>